Hi, everyone, and welcome to At Katie Couric. The facts and statistics are overwhelming. 68% of Americans are overweight or obese. Nearly 20% of children between the ages of 12 and 19 are obese, as are a third of all adults. In 1960, women between the ages of 20 and 29 averaged about 127 pounds. By 2000, that average had climbed to 157 pounds. We want to take a look at what we eat, how much we eat, and how we can make healthier choices. I'm joined by former FDA Commissioner Dr. David Kessler, author of The End of Overeating, and Eric Schlosser, journalist and author of Fast Food Nation. And I'd quickly like to say a thank you to the sponsor of our web show, Dove, and I'm glad today it's not Pringles. Hi, guys. Nice to see you. So, you know, you heard those statistics. I'm always just so startled, even though I've read them again and again. What in the world is going on here, David? It's really over the last three or four decades that this rise has happened. And as a physician, as someone interested in public health, it, it happened on our watch. What happened? What did we do? We took fat, sugar, and salt. We put it on every corner. You can't walk down the street for 10 feet without being bombarded with some queue, some food uh, establishment. We made it socially acceptable to eat any time of day, 24-7. Look at food, it's become entertainment. Walk into a food court. It's as if we're living in a food carnival. How did we become so obsessed with food, Eric, do you think? That, that you know, I, I read a funny article recently in the New York Times. It was a mom saying, why do I have to bring a snack to the soccer game? We've become so focused on eating 24-7. And she was saying, this is ridiculous. But why do you think it happened? I think a great deal had to do with the marketing. Uh, the processed food companies spend 8 to $10 billion a year on marketing each year. And they want to increase you know, the sale of their products. Uh, the fast food chains really pioneered marketing children, very small children. Uh, Burger King and KFC, I'm sorry, I'll, 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 Burger King and McDonald's have marketed Teletubby-related uh, food to children 16 months old. And so, you know, they've changed, uh, the marketers have changed the eating habits of American children and we're seeing the consequences now that those children are growing up often in poor health. So they're brainwashed from a very early age to crave these things. And and I know, David, a lot of your book is about how your brain chemistry is actually affected by your food choices and I guess by even the visual cues, correct, that we see in marketing and advertising? That, that's exactly right, Katie. We're all wired to focus on the most salient stimuli in our environment. What could those salient stimuli be? For some people, it's alcohol. It could be drugs. It could be gambling. It could be sex. But what's the most socially acceptable salient stimuli? I mean, it's food. And what is it about that food? It's the fat, sugar, and salt. They capture the brain circuits. We get cued. That cue activates our brain circuit. It stimulates thoughts of wanting. It causes that arousal. I have that momentary pleasure. It's gone in a second. I Next want time it again. I'm and it's making me hungry, right? <laughs> yeah. And the, the, so is that, that, that cycle of cue, activation, arousal, reward. And what did the food industry do? It attached, I mean, you walk in and there's toys with, with the food. It all reinforces that wanting. I mean, the best thing you can do, the most important thing you can do for a child, I mean, is to intercede early so that neural circuitry doesn't get laid down. Because for millions of Americans, you know, they, they, they eat when they're happy, eat, they, they eat when they're sad, they eat when they're hungry, they eat when they're not hungry, and no one's ever explained to them how their brains literally have been hijacked. Now, do food manufacturers, I mean, maybe I'm, I'm being a conspiracy theorist here, but do they put together ingredients that get us hooked on certain foods? In other words, is there, is it that sort of malevolent <laughs> in terms of, gee, if we put this much, you're not gonna be able to eat one potato chip, or is it just sort of the whole amalgam of ingredients that plays into this? Do they understand the neuroscience? No, but they learned how to design food, to optimize food for that bliss point. They learned experientially what works. And the fact is that it does activate the neural circuits. I could show you on the brain scans. 
And you, I know, Eric, say there's a huge disconnect in this country in terms of why we're so obese or why we're not making healthy choices or why we're so consumed by foods between where we're getting our food and sort of from the, the, the manufacturer to the dinner table. What do you mean by that exactly? Just that there's been a huge transformation in the last 30 to 40 years in how our food is produced and distributed. And I mean, like you said earlier, I, I don't think these companies are malevolent. I don't think they want to get their customers sick or obese. But this food is very carefully designed to make you want to eat it and then eat it again and again. They do intensive focus groups, even with toddlers, to find which exact formula uh, is the right one. And with most processed food now has flavor additives, which are very carefully studied. The amount of fat, the amount of salt, the amount of sugar are very carefully adjusted. So these aren't things that are just being made uh, in the back of the kitchen with a chef with a big white hat on. These are coming out of enormous factories. They're industrial commodities, and they're very carefully calibrated to taste good and want uh, you to buy them often. And in my work, what I've tried to do is go behind the veil and show the difference between this food and the food that we ate for generations in this country. Uh, you know, if you, if you think about the processed food that's sold at mass, most fast food restaurants, it looks the same. It looks similar to what we've been eating for generations, but it's a fundamentally different thing. How so? Well, as I said, it, it comes from these factories. It's carefully uh, been designed in, in different components, and all you need to do is look at the list of ingredients. And, uh, you know, in, in my book, Fast Food Nation, I, I gave the list of ingredients that if you wanted to make a strawberry milkshake, at home what you would need. I mean, strawberries, sugar, you know, milk, uh, ice. Um, and if, you know, you look at a fast food uh, strawberry milk You'd shake, have to call a chemist? You'd have to call a chemist. There's a long, long list of ingredients. So it, it's a different thing, although it looks... Wholesome. It looks wholesome and may not be. But, but what you did in Fast Food Nation was really to help us all understand, you know, back in the 30s, 40s, and, and 50s, and 19... You know, 30s, 40s, and, and 50s, in order to feed a hungry nation. The food industry appropriately learned how to process food, to be able to ship food over, you know, long distance. Th there was advantages of that, right? It, it provided uh, food, longer shelf life, uh, cheaper foods, and along the way, the industry learned to dial in. It learned to dial in fat, sugar, and salt. And it also, because the food is so highly processed, it goes down in a whoosh. I mean, back 30, 40 years ago, the average bite, we would chew maybe 20, 30 times. But can't today, when you eat something, how many, how, how many bites, how many chews there are? It goes down in a wash. It's actually self-stimulation. Because uh -huh. the, food, the food processing takes out anything objectionable mm. in the food. So it just goes down and we're constantly eating it and we don't stop. And with obesity, one of the things that we haven't mentioned is portion size in which the commodity prices have been driven down so low that portion sizes have increased enormously as a way of providing value, but that also is a lot of extra calories. It used to be if you went to a, a fast food restaurant, you'd get eight ounces of soda, now as small as 12 ounces of soda. It's not unusual to get a big gulp, which may be as much as 64 ounces of soda. and. Uh, that's an enormous amount of and sugar. And you go to the movies for 25 cents more, you can get a gigundo thing of popcorn, which yeah. is an additional 300 calories. Yeah. And now what used, to, what used to really be a platter is now a plate. And I was talking to a friend of mine who's a nutritionist. She said the plates used to be 10 inches, and now they're 12 inches mm. in diameter. So people, and what, what, I guess is it, I don't know, it's so funny because I'm, like this too, and you guys might be too, although you're so much more aware now, but you do want value and you think, wow, I'm getting a lot for my money. You don't really think I'm getting a lot of extra weight for my money yeah. by consuming all this, but it is sort of a funny way that Americans are programmed to think. Yeah. One of the simplest things somebody can do, because losing weight and keeping it off is so hard. Right? And what I have done is, you know, I now eat about half of what I used to eat, and I can be just as satisfied. Yeah, and, and well, let, let, I've got some uh, t Twitter questions, some tweets, if you will, and I want to kind of address them. There's so many things I want to talk to you guys about, but here's some. Uh, 
one tweet says, shouldn't we ban food advertising on TV the way we ban tobacco and hard liquor? Isn't this the elephant in the room? That's not realistic, is it? But watch an ad for food. You know, sometimes it's about the uh, value of the food. Is it ever about the nutritional content of the food? No. It's always about that emotional appeal. Well, sometimes for things like cranberry juice, isn't it kind of about nutrition or not really? I guess not. They're just standing the, in the that slogans, bog. <laughs> you'll, you'll love it. You'll want it. You'll, do, you'll have a good time. It adds that emotional gloss that, uh, that adds to that reinforcing quality of that food. That's what the uh, advertising does. But food can we ban advertising? No, food? But, but, but well, I, I wouldn't ban food advertising, but I would put strict limits on what sort of marketing can be done towards children. Um, you know, unhealthy foods shouldn't be marketed to children. Like and sugared cereals? Sugared cereals, fast foods, particularly children under the age of 12, 14. I mean, these companies very, very deliberately target young children because they know their eating habits are being formed formed young, and uh, I think that's, that's a public health issue. So for adults, you know, no, but for small children, yes. You have said, both of you, I think, that how this country and the government treated tobacco is a good model for bad food. And of course, you were behind, you spearheaded many of those efforts. But tell me how they're parallel or how they could go on parallel tr tracks. There are similarities, but there's also major differences. You can live without tobacco. You can't live without food. But what was the real success over the last 20, 30 years with tobacco? It wasn't the laws. It wasn't the regulations. It was that we as a country changed how we perceive that product. We used to look at a cigarette and say, that's my friend. That's going to make me feel better. That was cool. Certainly our parents and our parents' generation. What did we do? We now look at that cigarette for what it is, a deadly, addictive Product. We changed what scientists call the valence of the product. From It was, used to be positive, ne now it's negative. And that changes our behavior. Food, you know, we really have to change how we look at food. Right? We were, tobacco was demonized. Can't do that with food and shouldn't do that. But these huge portions, this highly processed food, I think we have to change how we look at food. And I think over the next decade or two, I think we're starting to, you know, go back and say, you know, is this food really real food? What's here? Is it just processed food? That's not what I want. I want food that's going to satisfy me. I want food that's nutritional. I want real food. I mean, can you imagine yeah. suing food companies because you're fat? I mean, because that's where it, it went with no, the tobacco I, I industry. Could see, I could see suing food companies for how they market to children um, and marketing unhealthy food to children. I'm actually more optimistic that this sort of model can work with food than with tobacco in some ways because in my view this isn't about driving certain companies out of business it's about changing how these companies do business and changing their business practices these companies can still sell food I, I think they can still market food to children but not food that's going to have a really negative impact on these children's health especially if you understand that the behavior is conditioned and driven it really does affect the neural circuitry. And that neural circuitry gets laid down for a lifetime. Does that mean once you understand that that behavior is conditioned and driven, the food industry, does that have to change? Absolutely. Government, greater role uh, in disclosure and education. But in the end, I mean, it's up to all of us to take control and decide what do we want. And I mean, I, I, my focus is so much on children because not only are their eating habits being formed, but their future health may be formed then. I mean, some studies have suggested that if you're obese by the age of 13, there's about an 80 or 90 percent chance you'll be obese for the rest of your life with so many other health complications. So I think uh, uh, Michelle Obama and the president are absolutely right to be focusing now on children's health. And these companies can play a large role in that. And, I, and, and again, they'll still be able to earn a profit. It's but not like we're really... demonizing tobacco and tobacco companies, but these companies have to take responsibility for their, the food companies have to take more responsibility for their products and what they're doing to American children. But do you think they will, Eric? I mean, we've been hearing this song for some time now. And I wonder, you know, we talked about corporate responsibility yeah. before we began taping. 
And when there's so much concern about the bottom line, when these are huge, huge businesses that, you know, make so much money, are they really going to be willing to take the steps they need to make to not market to children when they're selling a boatload of sugared cereals to, to families all over the country? I mean, are you, are you well, being clearly, a little naive? Well, they're clearly not going to do it voluntarily or they never would have done these practices to begin with. So I think with public pressure and pressure from government, I mean, one of the areas where we have enormous leeway to make a difference is in school meals. Uh, and what sort of food the, the government purchases, what sort of food we allow into schools. Hasn't that gotten better? I mean, hasn't the it's quality gotten, of school lunches improved, or is that just sort of it's in sporadic places? I think it's the beginning of it. But, I mean, if, if basically the government is going to have custody of your children uh, during the day and feed them a meal, there's the opportunity to introduce really healthy food and you know, not be subsidizing junk food. And there are many, many high schools and schools that have branded fast food that's you know junk food essentially. Or soda machines, and right? Soda and, machines. and it kills me when I see soda machines in hospitals. I think, hello, yeah. but they get money from these companies. So what's the impetus for them to say? And isn't health? Isn't providing this? I think is an interesting question. Someone tweeted about this. Isn't providing healthy food a lot more expensive? You go to inner city neighborhoods. And there are very few places you can buy produce. I mean, that is changing, and there have been a lot of movements that we've actually reported on. But, you know, if you want to go to the grossest fast food restaurant, where do you go? Oftentimes to the poorest neighborhoods. Yeah. So how can we change that? So Those can, are two questions. So I know. a candy bar mm -hmm. right, versus an orange. Difference in cost? Not much, right? What if I can't find an orange in my neighborhood? Well, then, I mean, you're right. I mean, and I think uh, the administration, the, the first lady, I think a lot of people are focused on that. But I, I question the assumption right, that real food, healthy food, um, is uh, more, more expensive. expensive. I mean, calorie for calorie, you know, there's no question there's more calories uh, in that candy bar than in that orange. But in some ways, if that candy bar only stimulates you to eat more and doesn't fill you up, in the end, you know, there's, there's certainly ways to eat healthy. Well, we, we've well, known about this for so long, Eric. Why, ha why aren't all schools, all public schools in this country, serving healthy food? They're underfunded, and a lot of them got rid of the cooks who made uh, food fresh and now get frozen processed food that might as well be fast food. And I think it will cost more money to provide healthy meals in America's schools, but that's a basic kind of investment. It'll cost enormously more money to have to children with, with diabetes and children who are obese. And if you look at, I mean, I think the latest calculation of the cost of obesity in the United States, and you may, you may have the, a better figure, is $150 billion a year. Now, that's an economic cost. That doesn't measure the emotional cost of what it is in a society that, that worships thinness to be obese, of what it is to be an obese child or an adolescent. And, and in my research, I've spent time with these kids. And, you know, it's, it's, it's hard. It's not just, you know, dooming them to a, a greater likelihood of asthma, cancer, et cetera. But, but the emotional the toll emotional it takes. Remember when kids we got to the point where kids would go up to their mother or father and say, please stop smoking. Mm -hmm. right. we, where we need to get to. I used to flush to, my mom's kents down right, the toilet. Right. Where we need to get to, we will know we're making progress. When kids start saying to their parents, please don't take me to that fast food restaurant. That's what it's going to take. We're really going to have to change how we look at food and, and how we eat. Well, what about the parents and their responsibility? I mean, uh, I think somebody asked a, a, a tweet question. Um, could, could you ask the authors, or what have they have observed as the most common behavior of parents related to childhood obesity? I mean, aren't many overweight, obese kids, don't they have overweight or obese parents generally? Not always, I know, but is that a, a trend? The, the British chef, Jamie Oliver, did a great show uh, in England in which he changed the school meals at a, at a state school in England and made them healthier. And uh, there was footage of some of the parents showing up at the school and putting french fries through the gate to their children. Uh, changing this obesity problem among children is going to really have to involve getting their parents uh, educated and involved as well, because otherwise it seems like you're th you're accusing them of being poor parents if if um, their children are unhealthy. The more research I've done, the more I've become convinced.
we have to be very careful. I mean, I am much more empathetic. You know, if you look at the, the problem is not people who are obese or, or overweight or healthy weight. It, it, the problem isn't weight. The problem is the food. Right. It, it's not a question. Uh, you know, somebody who's obese or, or overweight, we now know, I mean, it's not that they necessarily want to be like that. I mean, th their behavior has become conditioned, their neural circuitry has become wired. I think we have to be much, much more understand. empathetic and, and, yeah. and understand. And we have to give people the tools, no question, you know, the, the model behavior is, is key. Uh, and what you do as an adult affects what your kids are going to do, and they're always watching. We know that. Real quickly, if you had to tell Michelle Obama, these are the three things, actionable things you can do to reduce childhood obesity in this country. Because, you know, we hear it all the time. Yeah, get up and move. And at some point, you know, that's just not working for us, fellas. So what would you tell her the three most important things? Improve school lunches? Yes. I what would, else? I would put a garden in every school. I'd invest hugely in healthy food in the schools and nutritional education in the schools. I'd invest hugely in physical education in the schools. Yeah, because a lot of phys ed classes have just been canceled, yeah. right? And, and I would change the way we look at these, at big food. I'm not, I'm not talking corporate big. I'm talking literally big food. I mean, I would start the campaign where these huge portions become uncool. And I also would do that with processed Foods. I, I think it's important to change how we look at food in this country. So make uh, make processed food uncool. How do you do that? Like, ugh, that's uncool. Eating that Oreo when all the other advertising advertisements are telling us otherwise that it makes you happy and you're having a nice time with your grandfather dipping in a big glass of milk. You can have your Oreos, Katie. It's okay. No, I don't really like Oreos, but I'm just saying those are no. the images we see. And you're right. But, but we, we created those. We, we, we created well, I those. didn't create those. But, 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 but we as a society created those imagery, and we could change that. I mean, look at the French. Why up until recently have the French not been obese? Right? They, they eat true meals. They eat real food. They, they don't eat uh, all the time. What did we do in the United States? We took down those barriers. You know, I could be sitting here right now uh, and, you know, and drinking or I mean, even eating something and no one would think anything different. Let me ask you about a, a couple of aspects of our food supply that I, I'm interested in. We just did a two-part series on antibiotics and the routine use of antibiotics in healthy livestock, either to prevent disease um, or as, as a growth promotant to make animals grow bigger faster. And we got a, a fair amount of pushback from the industry, not surprisingly. And one of the articles basically said, you know, the claim that antibiotic use in livestock leads to more resistance in humans is not supported by science. In Denmark, the banning of antibiotic growth promotants led to an increase in pig deaths and it did not have a positive public health outcome. Basically, what a lot of farmers told us is, you know, we use it sparingly, only when we need to. But if a few of our pigs are sick, we want to protect the rest of the herd. So what is your take on the whole use of antibiotics? Because I know the CDC and many health experts say it is a, a ticking time bomb. And I just would like to hear from you in terms of what you both think. It concerns me greatly. I think the, the two pieces you did were very, very important. You talk to the professionals at FDA, and they say um, this long-standing practice really needs to be thoroughly examined and changed. The, the, I think what the industry got wrong, gets wrong, is where the burden of proof is, what you have to show when you use a drug, right? Before you use a drug, you have to establish that it's safe. The, the, there are real risks here. Using drugs in a non-therapeutic context, we have to do very, very, very sparingly. That practice really needs to be re-examined. I think these were very important pieces. I think this is a practice that has gone on for way too long without really uh, being in public view. Isn't part of the problem, Eric, is that we don't really know how widespread it is because there's no monitoring system in place. The FDA doesn't have access 
to a lot of these farms, yeah. and they say, well, they're monitored by veterinarians, and obviously people want to be responsible, but there's just no way to track it. The vast majority of antibiotics in the United States, I think it's 70%, is being fed to livestock. And what I try to do in my work is show how livestock are being raised. And once you see these modern factory farms, you realize why there is this temptation to use so many antibiotics sub-therapeutically. -thera um, these animals are crammed incredibly closely together and living in one another's waste. Um, and it's a perfect vector for spreading diseases. Po in poultry houses that have tens of thousands of birds in them, in the hog farms that have thousands of hogs crammed indoors their entire lives, if you look at a modern feedlot, it can have up to 125,000 cattle penned in together, living in one another's waste. Now, in the Middle Ages, human beings lived that way, and it was a perfect vector for the spread of all kinds of diseases. So having created this new industrial system, the meatpacking companies want to just dose all of their animals uh, with antibiotics. As Denmark has shown, it's not necessary to do that. And uh, I think your pieces were terrific. Oprah Winfrey was sued by the meatpacking industry some years ago for suggesting on her show uh, that there might be mad cow disease in the United States. She was right. So I'm, I don't think you'll be sued. I don't want to see you sued. But this industry has a record of viciously going after anyone who criticizes their practices, myself included. And I'm a meat eater, and I'm not... I'm not making an argument uh, on behalf of a vegan diet, but some of the industrial uh, meatpacking practices I think are very dangerous, and one of them is the overuse of antibiotics. Why, why uh, is it because of the demand for meat in this country? I mean, in other words, why are these animals being put, packed in so tightly? Is it because they just, the farmers just need to produce more and more and more? It's a very narrow, mar very narrow measure of efficiency. They have managed to provide cheaper meat when you buy it. But the real cost of the meat isn't reflected in the price that you pay. I mean, we have huge public health problems now connected to meat. I mean, there have been stories about E. coli outbreaks, um, huge environmental uh, costs of these factory farms. And in your own uh, story on antibiotics, you show the difference in the price of pork if you, you, if you use antibiotics or don't use antibiotics, the difference is minuscule. The, the difference in the price of meat, if you're really, really testing it for all these patho pathogens, is, is minuscule. But Didn't these you companies say it was one cent a pound to have to it? To thoroughly test ground beef for a wide variety of pathogens is a penny a pound. But, and the industry is refusing to do it. But, but understand what happens. If you use antibiotics when they're not absolutely necessary, right, you're going to kill... Uh, a lot of that bacteria, and which bacteria survive? Those that have molecular changes, those that are resistant. Right? You kill the ones that bacteria works on, and from a molecular evolutionary perspective, you develop these resistant changes in these bacteria, because those are the ones that, that are survived. So we have to be very, very careful whenever we use an antibiotic. There has to be a real reason, and it has to be limited, in my view, to when we're treating a disease, not for prevention, not for prophylaxis, not for non-therapeutic uses. And not to promote growth. I mean, we still don't understand exactly why it is that these livestock grow slightly faster when with, they antibiotics. with antibiotics. Something about it that helps their digestive system process food more rapidly? I don't know. I don't know I, I don't think anybody really knows. But I don't think that's a valid use for one of our you know, most important it, medicines for fighting important diseases. It's a real public health issue. Let me ask you about genetically modified food, because you yeah. hear so much about it. And I think people don't quite understand what it means. So can you guys explain in very simple terms what it is? So there's always been, for hundreds of years, you know, farmers have done plant breeding. They will you know, breed different crops, get new crop varieties. There's new advantages I mean, to those crops. And a lot of our, our foods are the result of plant breeding. Genetic engineering took that science to a whole new level. I mean, and it's much more powerful. Now, if there were advantages, if there were real advantages, I mean, to that technique, I mean, if we could feed nations right, 
because of genetic engineering, you know, the, the, you could provide food, then you can, I think, justify it. But the fact is that, that technique is so powerful, you could introduce new proteins, there, there are new issues. So again, the science is great when there's real benefits that are demonstrated. A lot of times, these techniques are used and you wonder, you know, I mean, are there real benefits from, you know, from using such powerful techniques on our well, food Well, what's supply? wrong with it? What's, I, 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 what's wrong with it? So if you genetically engineer a new food, Right? and you change the molecular structure of that food, you can introduce a new protein. And sometimes a protein could be a new allergen, and it could raise you know, people who are allergic, and, and we don't know it. Now, FDA has taken steps to try to monitor that, to make sure of it. But again, these are very powerful techniques. They have a lot of advantages, but they should be used widely, wisely, and when there's real benefit. Give me some examples. Yeah. Well, I mean... What they're doing is they're taking genetic material from one species and inserting it in a different species. Like? Like taking a, a, a genetic material from a bacterium and inserting it uh, into corn plants. And um, this is brand new science. And I'm not an opponent of genetically uh, modified organisms, particularly with medicines. I think that uh, there's the whole issue of informed consent. If you know this is a radical new medicine, a genetically modified medicine, you have the choice of whether you want to take it or not. My real opposition to genetically modified organisms in agriculture is it's been introduced on a wide scale without any real public debate and without any labeling. Now, in the case of genetically modified soy, um, it's been modified so that it can resist uh, a class of pesticides. Uh, in, in the case of Monsanto, it's a pesticide called Roundup, and it allows them to apply a lot more pesticide and it won't kill the soy plant. Uh, in the case of corn, they've inserted a gene in the corn from a bacterium that kills pests when they try to eat the corn. And this all sounds absolutely wonderful, but it's only been uh, out in our environment for about a decade. This is a, a radical experiment. And at the very least, each of us should have the choice to participate in that experiment or not. Now, the, the GMO companies like Monsanto have fought tooth and nail against labeling. And uh, the same is true for cloned animals, which are now just entering the food supply. Uh, the meat from cloned cattle, uh, the milk from cloned cows. I happen to oppose cloning. And uh, the industry has fought very hard against any labeling. And, you know, if these are such wonderful things, you'd think they'd want to label it. You know, contains why are clones. You against, why are you, you know? against cloned animals. Again, this is such a recent technology. I mean, I think the first cloned mammals were, were in the, the late, uh, in, in terms of cattle, was in the late 1990s. This is a radically new f way of, of propagating uh, uh, living creatures. It's clear that the offspring of clones are more likely to be unhealthy. Um, I think we're moving too quickly. So at the very least, we should be labeling these radically new foods uh, and giving us Just all a choice. Just making the consumer choice. aware. Yeah. yeah. I walked into one of my local restaurants. I was talking to, to the chef, and I said, what's the most important question I should ask you know, when I walk into a restaurant or when I sit down to eat? And he looked at me and he said, you should ask where the food is from. Now, I've never asked where the food uh, is from. And, and, you know, it's very interesting. I, I think there is a movement afoot, right? And it, it's not fully here, right? And I think it, it's, it's evolving. But I think we, we realize that understanding where our food is from, making sure it's real food, you know, that it's not highly processed, I think those are values, you know, that will serve us well, you know, not only with regard uh, to uh, obesity, but also what tastes good and what we can enjoy. And, I mean, one point, Dr. Kessler was head of the FDA. When you want to introduce a new drug, there are years and years of study of the health implications of that drug, the effectiveness of the drug. I mean, it can take a decade for a drug to gain regulatory approval. And yet these foods, like genetically modified organisms and like cloned animals, have just been put onto the market without any of that sort of testing. Why is that? And I think that we should, we should be following the... Why isn't the FDA being more vigilant about that? You have an FDA team in place. Or the Department of Agriculture, yeah. You know, I, 
you know, it is an enormous job. The current leadership uh, at both FDA uh, and USDA, uh, the current secretaries, you have a secretary of agriculture, uh, Vilsack, who is just terrific. I mean, you, you have USDA that cares today about public health. You have a commissioner uh, of FDA who cares a lot about uh, public health. Uh, they have a lot on uh, their plate. They have a whole new food safety uh, program. Um, they're working very, very hard. You know, I think the government's trying to do uh, their part. Food industry has to do their part. And we have responsibility as individuals. Yeah, someone asked about that. Whatever happened to moderation? Like people actually moderating what they are, they're consuming instead of blaming the fast food restaurants or this, that, and the other thing. But, you know, the flip side of that is that we're being manipulated from a very early age and kind of programmed to want these things is what you're saying. If it was just one person responding to this marketing and becoming obese, you might be able to assign you know, personal responsibility of the, you know, is a perfect explanation of why they became obese. But when the obesity rate among American children has tripled uh, in a generation, when we have gotten to the point where two-thirds of all adults are overweight or obese, um, there's something in the environment, and it's and the marketing. Type 2 diabetes you know, is skyrocketing, di right, diabetes. among children. Yeah. Let me I, ask you, can I, I, I wait, just, sorry, just, go ahead. You know, that's just so important. You know, I learned as a physician how to take care of a 50-year-old or a 60-year-old with type 2 diabetes. Type 2 diabetes, I could just as well write obesity in the medical chart. I know the consequences of that 50, 60-year-old getting type 2 diabetes, getting the retinal complications, getting the cardiovascular complications. But Katie, a 10-year-old getting type 2 diabetes, that scares me. I have no idea of the consequences. What is it going to be like for that child? For if that child lives for six, seven decades with type two diabetes, none of us, none of us in the medical community have ever experienced that. And now they're talking about giving statins to kids who are eight years old, which to me seems just completely absurd. I guess from a medical point of view, maybe you need to do something to protect them, but it just seems so. I've talked to crazy pe pediatric surgeons who've done bypasses on teenagers. I mean, who already have, you know heart disease. Two more areas I just want to touch on. Um, I could talk to you guys all day, but one is um, hormones in milk. Yeah. Now, when I buy milk at the grocery store, I get organic because it's hormone free. And, and so how concerning should we be? Uh, how concerning should it be that cows are being given hormones to produce more milk? I guess 24 seven, because normally, you know, they're like women. They're going to produce milk when they yeah. have calves, not sort of round the clock every day of the year, right? Who, who, who wants to take on hormones? Well, and There's been a real pushback against growth hormones being used uh, in cows. And I think, I think Walmart announced this year they're not going to buy any more milk uh, from cows that have been given growth hormones. So there's actually a decline now in the use of those hormones. One of the concerns was these cows were so overproducing uh, milk that they were getting infected. They were getting mastitis because their bodies just couldn't handle that much milk production. And because they were getting infected, they were more likely to be given antibiotics. And you just didn't want to get, you just don't want to get milk from, from unhealthy animals. Um, the issue of hormone use in cattle is also controversial. I mean, in the European Union, um, growth hormones are largely banned uh, from cattle. Uh, in the United States that are routinely given to feedlot cattle. And, and there, are, there was a study, a Danish study that came out a few years ago that suggested that we might have elevated levels of breast cancer and prostate cancer in the United States because of our use of uh, growth hormones in cattle. We looked very hard at the science of growth hormones in milk. And I think everything we saw was that the safety profile really wasn't affected. But it's an example where the technology developed, there really wasn't a use for it. And it was a technology that went searching for, for a use and it. We didn't need a drug I mean, to produce more milk. And there were certain economic advantages. And I just think we have to be very careful, I mean, with some of these newer technologies. But I think you can feel pretty comfortable that the milk is safe. 
It was buying sort of regular milk because there was some sort of theories that it was making girls get their periods earlier yeah. and, you know. Look, if you want to know, I mean, the greatest risks, I mean, I, I, think that, I think there's two that we need to focus on. I think it's the macronutrients. I mean, it's the stuff that's, it's the fat, sugar, and salt. That's number one. And, and I do think um, really looking very hard at antibiotic use to me, that's, that's very, very important. Right now, I would focus on those two um, as very important ones. But real quickly, Eric, yeah. I was going to say, when we talk about growth hormones in cattle, mm -hmm. is that like when you give growth ho hormones to chickens so they'll have big breasts um, and, and because people like white meat or whatever and they're almost so top heavy they can't walk i know that was in food inc which you had a big voice in yeah in in the in the chicken it's more the how the chicken have been bred to produce is large that breasts. so would that be considered a genetically modified food that no, chicken with that, the big that would breasts? be that would be how the chicken has been bred it, uh -huh. it's not genetically modified but what's what's interesting is some of the very same hormones that are routinely given to american feedlot cattle are the same hormones that are being abused by athletes and that are banned by the DEA. Um, and so on the one hand, we say these hormones are bad for athletes to take because they have all kinds of you know, potential health harms. On the other hand, they're being massively and routinely used in American feedlots just so these cattle will grow a little faster. Now, something Dr. Kessler uh, has mentioned a number of times is ultimately, you know, we should be following a precautionary principle. If you're going to introduce new technologies into our food system, particularly if you're not going to label it, uh, the burden of proof that it's safe should be on you, the company that's doing it. And that burden doesn't exist right now. One of the things that I, fo I find most disturbing about genetically modified foods is the farmers who buy, for example, Monsanto seeds have to sign a document when they do that they will not allow these seeds to be handed over for independent research. There's almost no independent research being done on ge these genetically modified seeds. I'm not saying that they're dangerous. I'm not saying that people are going to be getting sick as a result. But we need much more research on the health impacts of these new technologies. And the re research shouldn't be done by the companies who are manufacturing them and profiting from them. OK, my last question, because I know yeah. I'm getting tr in trouble from the control room saying, OK, okay. wrap it up, even though I th I, it's so interesting, is Lately, I've been seeing these ads on the television sort of uh, trying to, to make people less nervous about high fructose corn syrup. And, and it's from the Corn Refiners Association. And I wanted to ask you, first of all, what is high fructose corn syrup and why has it been demonized and has it been fair or unfair? You, <laughs> Dr. Kessler. Concentrated sweetener from corn high fructose, fructose is a sugar, uh, corn syrup. Uh, it is a highly processed sweetener. Um, in my view, it just stimulates us to eat more. Um, is it metabolically different than sugar? I mean, there, you talk to scientists, you get different answers. Regardless of the answer, it has very little role, I think, uh, in the American diet. But is it any worse than sugar? I don't know that it is worse. I mean, Dr. Kessler's right. There, there's a lot of disagreement as to whether we metabolize it differently from sugar. The most significant part for me is how cheap it is because corn has been so heavily subsidized for years. And because it's so cheap, it's enabled food processors to put it into almost it, everything, it, yeah, everywhere. And, and it is. It is in everything. I was looking I, on the labels, it, and, you know, even the strawberry jam I, I bought had high fructose corn syrup in it. Yeah. And uh, the food is layered and loaded. In cereals, obviously it has, yeah. it's, right? It's just, we, we've, we've layered and loaded our food with, you know, whether it's high fructose corn syrup or, or sugar, fat, and salt. And the result is, it's just making us bigger, it's making us eat more. I'm just gonna show that, that I don't know if you all have seen these ads, but it's just sort of interesting, yeah. and I wanna get your take on it, and then I think we're gonna have to wrap things up. <laughs> you want a bite? I thought you loved me. I do. Take two bites. It's got high fructose corn syrup in it. So? Well, you know what they say about it. What? That it's, it, um. That it's made from corn, has the same calories as sugar or honey, and it's fine in moderation.
You only wrote one. <laughs> Get the facts. You're in for a sweet surprise. So clearly, I mean, the corn industry is aware that people are questioning the use and the ubiquity, if you will, of high fructose corn syrup. Yeah. It may be my mind, but I, I was struck by the way she was offering him to take a bite. You know, I don't know. <laughs> that was the part of the ad that struck me as, hmm. Um, we're not going to go there. We're not going to go there. <laughs> yeah. I think they're trying to market their sweetener. I think that's what it is. I mean, they just... Their, their, their sweetener has come under Should attack. Should I try to buy things people. that don't have high fructose corn syrup in it? Absolutely. Real food, food that you know where it's from, food that you're going uh, to enjoy, but food that, that, that's real food, food that is not as highly processed as we've learned over the last three or four decades. We have to move this country. We have to change how we look at food. And real quickly, you know, you're ta talking about how we're programmed from an early age. We can't really send the entire nation to food rehab, right? I mean, what, realistically, what can we do? I do think we can look at these huge portions differently. I do think we can look at processed uh, food differently. I think we can serve um, foods to our children uh, that we know uh, is, is healthy. And, and I think the First Lady deserves a lot of credit this week. Uh, I think she, she got it right. I think she's pitch perfect. But she can't do it alone. I, I think we need to make a major investment in the health of American children and prevent them from being exploited for profit by these food companies. Is it and, too late for the rest of us? Well, no. I, I think that any one individual has it within his or her power to try to make these sort of changes. But, but information is power, mass. isn't it? I mean, that's... Don't underestimate how hard this is going to be. It took 30, 40, 50 years to change how we look at tobacco. We succeeded. Yeah. That was easy compared uh, to this challenge. Um, I'd, I'd like to think that getting these food companies on board and giving them the incentive to produce healthier f food could speed the process up. And again, it's not putting them out of business, it's changing their business practices. How do you incentivize them to do that, though? They'll change when we change and what we, when we make known what we want. All right, Eric Schlosser Great. and David Kessler, thank you guys so much for coming in. It was a really interesting conversation. I appreciate it so much. Thank you, Kim. Thank, Thank you. you. And thanks again to all of you who tweeted in some questions. Thanks for watching as well. And now stay tuned for a message from our sponsor, Dove, which you cannot eat.